Good morning. My name is Seven Song, and I'm going to be teaching you a class today about using herbs and herbal medicine for uh, internal and external infections. A lot of this information is derived from my doing first aid work at wilderness events, where often we're one of the primary care providers uh, until people can get to a hospital or other medical care. And so in my time, I've seen a lot of acute uh, infections. And then uh, working in a free clinic, I've seen a lot more chronic infections. And so there's a few goals I have of this class today. Uh, one of them is that this, this information is practical and useful for people. Um, but I think that's really the main goal. Uh, I think herbal medicine provides a lot of care, a lot of comfort um, for many people. And infections, of course, are very, very common. There are many infectious agents, as we'll get into. So uh, here we go. So some more of uh, what I'd like to focus. So there, are, excuse me. So there are a number of organisms that create problems or infections in our body. Uh, the two that I'm gonna focus on mostly in this uh, class is gonna be bacteria and fungi, but I'm gonna go over some of the other organisms that uh, create health strains for uh, human beings and for lots of other animals. We'll cover some of the categories that are really important to understand like anti-inflammatories, pain relievers, uh, antibacterials, antivirals. So one of the goals is always for me, is not always thinking what herb do I need, but what category do I need? Uh, this makes my job easier in the sense of, as a healthcare practitioner um, to not get stuck in like, what plant do I have? What plants do I not have? So if I'm in a situation where I need an anti-inflammatory, I can look around and think, oh, look, there's poplar. And while I usually use willow, uh, poplars are related and can be used as anti-inflammatories. Uh, this class also is just going to be me talking to a camera. Hello, you, and hello, camera. Um, it, there's no slideshow associated with it. I do have photos uh, I can direct at one time that show some infections that I've worked with, mostly staph infections, since they're very cameraable, uh, very visual. Uh, internal infections, of course, are not. Uh, so I'm also going to cover some treatment for some specific infections, uh, including dental infections, um, staph infections, and Lyme disease, which is a Borrelia infection. Uh, this, the class, like while this class is very practical, when I go to those specific infections, my goal is less to give people uh, specific treatment ideas and more to give an overview on herbs that you can use uh, in these situations. In other words, I'm not giving a class on Lyme disease or on dental infections, those are classes within themselves but I wanna cover infections and I think it's helpful to go over the categories that I would cover in a few specific infections. So let's go for some definitions. Uh, what is an infection? Uh, so there's a number of categories, but infection is a very broad category. And basically it means you have organisms living in your body uh, that are normally not normally present or they are harmful and creating disease. Disease is even a broader category than infections. So basically infection is almost any, any organism or quasi-organism uh, that's disrupting your homeostasis. The next term is the word parasite. And I wanna use this term because in general, I don't use it very much in healthcare because, <laughs> because the term is overused and the term is often misused. And if you're a healthcare practitioner watching this of any stripe, you know, very commonly people will say, I have parasites. And it can mean anything from I have constipation to I have headaches to I've read this book. Um, but there are there is a definition of parasite. I tend to stick to it. And the term parasite is an organism that lives on another organism, the host. In this case, you would be the host and derives nutrition or some benefit from the host without giving anything back or more likely uh, having a negative response and interfering with the host's um, health, and their, the host's general health. So there are basically three major categories of parasites. I'm not going to cover any of these. I just I have one, I have an agenda uh, with the word parasite, which is to make the word parasite more what I consider it, a more the medical term. Of course, working with an individual and they say that parasite. My goal is not to patronize and use medical terminology. 
but I, in general, I do feel like it's an overused term and we can bring it back to kind of its roots. Uh, I'm not really sure these are its roots, but the medical terminology associated. So there are three main kinds of parasites. So remember the definition of a parasite is uh, something that derives nutrition or benefit from a host without offering anything in return and often causing harm uh, by basically using up food supplies or uh, other issues, or other complications while it's deriving nutrition from you, the host. So the first are protozoas. Uh, protozoas are, I mean early animal and they include things like amoebas and they give amoebic dysentery um, they include things like Leishmanias, which are transferred from sand flies, which is Leishmaniasis, which I see much more common in uh, Central America. And another one are the plas is the genus Plasmodium, but the genus Plasmodium is very big, but it's uh, the protozoa that contributes or causes malaria. So parasite, so this is a group of protozoas. Uh, they can be difficult to kill, though I have used herbs. We'll discuss one or two herbs that are anti-protozoal, which is a specific category. They're much bigger than most of the other categories. They're much bigger than bacteria and viruses, uh, than those two things. Uh, the next group of parasites are what are called helminths. And helminths are worms. And they're the worms, they're the uh, worms that live inside of us uh, and that cause bodily harm. So you have uh, tapeworm, roundworm, um, pinworms. And so the helminths are a group of worms uh, that are parasitic on other, on other hosts, on hosts and us. Again, I won't be talking about treatment, but this is another classic use of the word parasite. And the last are the ectoparasites. Ecto means on the outside. Uh, the first two, the amoebas and the helminths are endoparasites. They live on the inside of us. The ectoparasites live on the outside of us. And you can imagine what they are. Uh, they're ticks, uh, lice, scabies, fleas. Uh, where I live in upstate New York, uh, of course, ticks are our most problematic ectoparasite because they transmit uh, the bacteria of Borrelia, which we'll talk about, which causes Lyme disease. They also transmit other diseases. Mosquitoes tend to not be called ectoparasites, so they kind of fit into the category, but the main ones are really the, the ones that live on us and stay on us for longer. So scabies, um, lice, mites, uh, ticks. So that's it for uh, the word parasite. Organisms that live on the host, don't contribute to them and usually do harm. All the ones I mentioned do harm to the human host. The next term I wanna discuss is the word pathogen because I'll be using this word uh, regularly. Uh, pathogen is basically any organism that disrupts homeostasis of another organism. So a pathogen basically is whatever gets in your body or on your body and creates ill health. It's a very, another broad category, but there are five main pathogens uh, that affect human health on a regular basis. And uh, they are bacteria, viruses, helminths, protozoas, and fungi. So again, to go over these, so there are a few other parasites that definitely affect uh, humans, but generally the ones that affect us the most commonly, well, the ones that affect people I see the most commonly are clearly bacteria and viruses. And then after that, you have protozoal infections against, again, like malaria or amoebic dysentery, uh, worms, uh, the, 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 which is the broad category, helminths, the par parasitic worms. And with them, you have you know, pinworms, roundworms, tapeworms, and then you have fungi. And so with fungi, uh, you have fungal infections. They could be external like tinea versicolor, uh, or they could be internal often in the respiratory system. Uh, yeast would be a kind of fungal infection as well. So moving on from that, again, I'll be focusing on bacteria and viruses. Uh, moving on from that, I uh, just, I wanna go over some of the overall considerations that we want to employ when working with infections. Uh, first is killing the pathogen. I mean, that's like, if you have an infection, you will generally will be harder to recover as the pathogen lives in your body and replicates in your body. I mean, they don't all replicate, like worms just grow bigger and bigger and bigger over time. So depending on the kind of worm. And so the overall goal, if possible, we'll talk about chronic versus acute in a minute because it's different when you're treating in a chronic infection, one that's long-term rather than an acute infection, one that's just recently happened and might be quicker to get over. Uh, so big goal in treating infections is to kill the organism, the pathogen. 
Uh, second, reduce symptoms, all right? Whatever you can do, pathogens cause symptoms like GI dysfunction, uh, headaches, body pain. Uh, so all of these, you know, while you're trying to kill the organism, we're always trying to relieve uh, the symptoms and relieve pain and other symptoms as well. So the person feels more comfortable. Uh, they're often done simultaneously. Often you're trying to kill the thing while often relieving the symptoms. Another goal is prevention, if it's possible, if the person gets fungal infections and avoiding moldy areas, if they're, so it's often difficult. Uh, but I mean, here we are during the season of COVID, the very, very long season of COVID. Uh, just to be very clear, I am a pro-vaccination herbalist. So uh, that's what I, this is just to say this, I'm not really trying to start controversy, uh, but what, I'm, what I wanna make sure I'm not saying is, I feel like you can just take herbs for every infection. For some infections, especially when they affect community health, I think other medical interventions can be important. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, the reason I brought it up though is prevention during COVID has been hand washing, which does extraordinarily well if it's consistent and social distancing. Uh, so these are preventative measures that people have learned to take to heart uh, during this outbreak of this uh, very strong uh, virus that's been going around. Um, next, another, another idea for this, this kind of set of goals when somebody has infections uh, is building immunity and resistance. Uh, that can be everything from diet changing, uh, potential exercises, breathing exercises, relaxation exercises, uh, and taking immune strengthening herbs. So, I mean, everybody's gonna get some infections. These, all these bacteria and viruses and proto, they wanna live and we are a host and sometimes we will get sick. But if you get sick very regularly, more often than other people, uh, one of the goals might be to uh, increase your resistance using uh, plants like astragalus or Ganoderma. But actually if you, other problems, like if you're having constant stress and that's in, in decreasing your immune resistance then helping with your stress, right? So it's not always just these immune adaptogen or these immune modulating herbs. It also has to do with, with the situation and who you are and what is creating, what is depressing your uh, immunity. And one more thing that I just think is really important to know is it's really great to always replenish and have a good stock of herbal medicines at home, whether you make them yourself or purchase them. Um, because when you get an infection, especially if it's you and there's nobody around you, you know, it's hard to get herbal medicine. So I'm not saying conventional medicines aren't helpful. They can be very helpful. But I am saying that if you need echinacea or Oregon grapefruit or myrrh, it's good to have a, a stock of the plants that I'm about to cover later in this uh, at home so that you can treat it and take the amounts that you need, which are often much higher, especially for acute illnesses as we'll get to acute infections. So next we have uh, chronic versus acute infections. So a chronic infection is when you've had a long time. For instance, Lyme disease is often a very chronic infection, um, but it could be acute. Some people get it and get rid of it quicker. Uh, and then you can have acute infections, which means it comes on, it just recently came on and your goal or the concept is to just get rid of it quickly. So for instance, many staph infections are acute. Like the person gets a staph infection and within a couple of days, you can help them get rid of the staph infection. Sometimes staph infections do become chronic. So all these things have different stages, but the goal here is talking about whether, you know, if you've had a longstanding health issue, if you have a chronic health issue, it's one thing versus you've never had this infection before and now you have this infection. So with acute infections, really your goal is even more strongly to try to kill the organism as quickly as possible. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is to take larger loading doses of herbs. Uh, loading dose is the first dose or first couple of doses you take of a medicine. And so a loading, if somebody has a staph infection or uh, has some respiratory infection or some dental infection, whatever the infection is, um, if they have an organism living in them, if it's possible, if the person is strong enough and stable enough to just give lots of infection fighting herbs, herbs that kill organisms, or at least inhibit their re uh, replication um, to reduce the reduce consequences in them. So um, 
it's always one of the goals, but in sometimes with acute infection with somebody who's fairly healthy, you can really just go for it. You know, just give them like five mils or four mils of uh, your tinctures or whatever herbs you're giving them. That's just tincture form. A tea would be much more quantity um, that you might give them. So you might give them strong cups of tea of the herbal teas uh, three to five times a day. Uh, so that's that's really the thing about acute is just to go for it if possible, depending on the person's frailty and strength. Uh, for chronic infections, it's much more difficult because often the person is that organism has been inhabiting them, whether it's a worm or a virus or a bacteria or a protozoa has been inhabiting them for a while. And so it, it's harder to kill them. Uh, you might need strong herbs, but often it's already created a deficit in their health. And so if the person's had a long-standing deficit in their health, the person has been under, their health has been undermined by an organism, often they're not as strong. So they're maybe in a slightly more frail state, not quite as stable homeostasis, sorry, I don't think that's really a word. Um, and so then your goal with these herbs um, is to kill the organism once again, but also you might need to be nourishing them at the same time and maybe not giving as much per dose, but knowing that the person might have to take it for days, weeks or months, definitely. I've worked with people with Giardia, which is a protozoa, and it takes many weeks uh, to kill it if the, if the person's had the Giardia for a long time. Uh, Giardia is often misdiagnosed as other things, but let's say the person actually does have Giardia, it does exist. Uh, so that's, that's just different. That's, so that's sorting out between acute and chronic infections. I wanna spend a few minutes on fever. So what's interesting is, uh, so, you know, as many people here have done, maybe almost everybody probably watching this, you've had your temperature taken uh, in the past uh, year, probably many times. I work in a free clinic every time you come in. And I've wondered because my temperature used to be higher. And every time they use uh, the forehead uh, thermometer, uh, the whatever those guns are called, um, my temperature has often been 96.7, 96.8, and that's just not my normal body temperature. So I wanna say a few things about that. First, body temperature has been decreasing by 0.5 something <laughs> Fahrenheit uh, every decade for about a hundred years. The normal body temperature now for people, at least in the US, I'm not sure worldwide, is actually something like, uh, 97.8, not 98.6. 98.6 was the normal taken in 1880. Our temperatures are actually lower now. There's a lot you could read into this and it's very interesting, but it seems standard. You can go online and uh, look it up. So in other words, our body temperature is lower. That means 99, 99.5 or 100 is a higher temperature if your normal body state is 97.5, let's say. I also wanna say that the, many of the thermometers, the forehead ones are about one degree lower than uh, accurate. So that's what I was saying, I, I had to look into it because I was wondering why my temperature was always so low. Um, and that's, that's in lots and lots of the literature also that you can find online. Now back to fever. So fever is a symptom, right? Fever means that the infection has caused your immune system to proliferate in a way to send special chemical messengers into look into your brain to say to raise your temperature. So it's, it's telling your body that something potentially could be more serious, but it's also the mechanism for helping your body with that organism. And so th the goal with fevers is not always to lower the fever, but again, kill the organism right? Because once the organism is dead and once it's kind of moved out of your body and your immune system gets it that it's less of it, then your temperature is going to go down. Now, if the person is frail or if they're very young or if, there's, if the temperature is rising fast, then definitely you want to reduce the temperature. You know, you want to take an NSAID or a herbal medicine, uh, NSAIDs or things like aspirin and ibuprofen um, to lower the temperature because the temperature itself can be problematic. But in general, the fever is an indication that something is wrong. Many things, by the way, cause fever that are not infections that you might want to check out. If you have a constant low-grade fever, it's an excellent idea to seek out professional help, medical help, and see if there's anything else that might be causing that fever. So deep breath, not really deep breath, just a shoulder breath. Um, so when you have a fever, uh, it, could, it might or may not be serious, but it should be taken seriously. Like I have a fever, you have a fever, 
um, what does it indicate? And do you need to seek medical help? Do you need to take conventional medications? Maybe not. Lots of times fevers are reducible with herbal medicine, with conventional care, and they can go down by themselves depending on your body's resistance. So uh, what I'm trying to say is fevers are a good indication that something is wrong. Uh, fever, there's a lot of numbers with fevers and I'm not gonna go through those, but you can see like some numbers are just high and they're, they're definitely danger zone numbers. Um, but what I would suggest to everybody is to get a good thermometer, maybe one you put under your tongue um, and learn your, your basal body temperature so you know what your, if your temperature is higher, what is like, if you have a normally have a higher temperature, like let's say you have 99.4, then 100.1 is not as high to you as it is to somebody with a temperature of 97.8. So it's just, a, but I, you know, in general, I would suggest everybody knows all their basal numbers, get, you know, get your lab test, know you, your normal numbers in your body. So when things change, you can see the difference because of course there is no normal body. We all have different of all these different lab values that you might take. Ready? Am I doing okay here? Uh, I'm trying to change my screen when I want to change this screen. Um, today's really beautiful outside. So I live in Ithaca, New York, and uh, it's our first sunny day in about three days is Memorial Day, so May 31st. Um, and just, uh, yeah, it's just really lovely. It's slightly chilly, probably about 66 degrees. Um, but it's nice to see the sun and the rain was clearly needed. And my discussing the weather here is absolutely not needed, but here we are personalizing the presentation. So the next thing I wanna do less personalized is what's called lymph angitis. So right now you're thinking, will you get to herbs? I probably will. You may wanna skip forward a little bit. I have a few more things, not too much before I get to herbs, uh, but you know, I wanna you know, discuss it. You have to discuss the body before you go right into herbs. Anyway, that's how, I, that's how I like to look forward to it or look at it. So lymphangitis is when you get um, a, a red line, I, often I'll see it in arms, sometimes on legs. It's usually hands, arms, and legs. And it's a red line creeping up from the point of infection towards your torso, towards your heart, really. So lymphangitis is an inflammation of your lymph vessels. It is not blood poisoning, right? You, that's not what blood poisoning looks like. So, or I'm not really sure exactly what blood poisoning looks like, frankly. I don't see a lot of sepsis or blood poisoning, but I see lymphangitis fairly regularly. Like somebody will be hiking or someplace I'm working and they'll get a cut. Like I had a really, somebody had a really nasty cut right in here, which doesn't heal that quick. And then there was a red line coming around. So lymphangitis, again, it's like kind of like a fever in the sense of it's helpful to take it, to note it and to take it seriously, but you don't always necessarily have to treat it seriously. Sometimes herbal medicines can help, but if that red line keeps moving up, it is gonna eventually, as all lymph vessels do, move towards the heart and then put it into blood supply, which is where all lymph vessels drain into, just like blood vessels drain into. So I'm gonna say this again. So lymphangitis, some people call it like the angry red line, some people call it blood poisoning, but it's an inflammation due to infection, almost always strep or staph. So lymphangitis is almost always a sign of strep or staph in your lymphatic system. And it, so what I usually do if I'm in a medical situation is we just make, a, we'll get a black marker and make, make a circle around it or make a line and see how fast it's traveling. Because if things are working, you can reduce it. But let me be, also be clear, it could be very serious. You don't want whatever infection is moving towards your heart. So you, have to, you might have to take care. So um, often what we do if we see lymphangitis in the field is we make our, you know, make it, discuss it with the patient and say, if this gets worse in one day or two days or three days, whatever you decide, please go get medical help. Usually they'll be getting antibiotics because it's almost always a bacterial infection. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and I wanna implore everybody to take everything seriously um, at the same time, there are herbal medicines that sometimes help in these situations. Next, simples versus formulas. So a simple is when you give one herb at a time. Oh, an herb, <laughs> my dear. So, uh, an, um, so, excuse me a second. Uh, I've just been disconnected. Here we are again. So simple is when you give one herb at a time and a formula is when you give multiple herbs at a time, usually in the same tea or tincture or glyceride. 
I just want to say that I pretty much always, there's just a few herbs that I might mention that I use as simples one at a time, like anemone or lobelia. Um, but in general, uh, I, I give people formulas for infections because you want multiple herbs congruently working together because they have different chemicals that might inhibit the replication of these organisms and kill them. So in general, I give formulas for two reasons. First reason I just mentioned, and I'll say it again, is that I give multiple different kinds of herbs. So I might give organ grape root with myrrh, with yarrow in it, because each herb has antimicrobial or kill certain microbes um, in different manners. The constituents kill them in different manners. And if you multiply that, if you use different herbs, you're getting better chance of something inhibiting or killing uh, the organism in your body, the pathogen. So, um, and the other reason is often there's other stuff going on, which we'll discuss as well, I'll discuss right now. So like, for instance, if people have Lyme disease, you have Lyme bacteria in the body, but you also often have uh, mental health can be affected like brain fog or fatigue or insomnia. And so you might put in the same formula herbs for that. Another classic example or common example, if somebody has dental pain and you're trying to kill the infection, uh, dental infections, excuse me, that's almost always a lot of pain because it hits the trigeminal nerves and you're right there and bam, right to the brain. So like when I give herbs to kill infections for dental infections, almost always pain relievers. Or if somebody has a respiratory infection, often they have a cough. And so you're trying to kill the infective agent, but often trying to reduce the cough, which is could just interrupts the quality of life. So often I use formulas because you have multiple ways of, you have multiple symptoms going on as well as the organism and trying to inhibit or kill that as well. All right, on we go. So what I do now is I just wanna read uh, and say um, some of the common preparations that I use. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this um, because I often do. And, but these are the common internal and external preparations. Some of them could be used both internally uh, and externally for infections. Uh, so again, the focus here is going to be on bacterial and viral infections, excuse me. Um, but many of these could also be used for other kinds of infections. Worms could be way more difficult because, excuse me again, because worms can be very large organisms. And so you're trying to kill a large organism in your body. Sometimes just can be very difficult with the amount of herbs necessary. Uh, each category, frankly, carries its own health risks. And, uh, and ways that you have to work to try to, to kill it. Or once again, as I said, inhibit its replication. Because for a bacteria, once you inhibit replication, as many antibiotics do, and then they'll just die off. Uh, so these are just in alphabetical order. Uh, so pretty much everything I give in this class is in alphabetical order rather than in uh, you know, what's the most important to the least important. It's just an um, alphabetically ordered mind here. So common internal preparations uh, include capsules. Capsules and powders are very similar. So basically, sometimes I'll mention using a powder, which is you take a powder and you stir it in some water or some drink and you drink the powder, or you could put the powder in a capsule. Um, a lot of the differences in capsules have to do with the stability of the herb. Uh, many herbs like let's say chaparral is very stable and you can powder it and put it in a capsule and for years it'll work. Other herbs, you powder them like yarrow and the stability is gone very quickly. And so capsules work, but only if you take them not that long after they've been powdered or you've packed them very well, uh, something beyond, you're gonna probably need some kind of specialized equipment to you know, air seal it in and, and stop the oxidation process. So capsules, uh, internally, I sometimes use a few essential oils. In general, I'm not much of an essential oils person. Um, I do think they offer a lot of benefit. It's just, it's just not something I play with. I don't make them, I guess, is really a big part of it. Well, I gather a lot of my own plants, uh, but there are a few essential oils that I do use for infections internally and externally. Uh, gargles can be really helpful for strep throat, which is a common bacterial infection. So it's usually a strep infection or streptococcus infection. And so I just want to point out that I think gargles are underused. If you have, if you, the back of your throat is sore, uh, gargling, uh, with an herb allows contact time with that herb in there. Uh, so consider gargles uh, when you have sore throats. 
Uh, the next are glycerites. Uh, glycerites are plants in glycerin. Uh, they're they're very stable, which is great. They don't extract that. Many, they don't do many plants that don't get extracted well in glycerin unless you do different like an alcohol intermediate. But there are many plants that are extracted well in glycerins, uh, like your aromatic herbs are very extractable. Things like chaparral are extractable in glycerin, which is not very tasty. But um, uh, plants, and especially if they have high aromatics, because the aromatic compounds, if they're the medicinal aspect of the plant, they come out really nicely in glycerin. Uh, some other ways of helping for respiratory infections are steam inhalations. You might use essential oils here. So if you have a sinus infection, for instance, um, putting herbs in a pot and steaming them and getting them into your sinuses is a really good way uh, to get them there. Uh, something that just is a word, I don't really know if there's a technical word for this, but in dental infections, swishes are really useful. So it's kind of a gargle in the front of your mouth. So you, probably, you have done this, right? Probably you've taken fluid, move it back and forth. And for dental infections, swishing the herbs uh, could be a helpful way to get the herb in there because it's, it's hard to it's just going to keep it all right there. So often you move it back and forth. Now I'm getting all saliva. Excuse me. I need a little water here. Um, next preparation, uh, tea. One thing to know about tea, it, water is the universal solvent. So it's really extracts more medicines, not every medicine, but more medicines than most. Uh, it's a problem is stability, right? And also you have to make it. So there's that as well. Uh, but teas are very helpful for infections externally and internally. Uh, I mostly use tinctures, but it's just a kind of a laziness about me uh, because I can make lots of tinctures and I have made lots of tinctures. And so I could just have a lot of tinctures on me and then mix and match them uh, as needed for people. Uh, so, and they're just very stable and lots of plants come out pretty well, especially if they're uh, hydroethanol, water, alcohol extract. Uh, which is most tinctures, right? Most tinctures have some water in them. And so I use a lot of tinctures, but their biggest problem um, is that lots of people don't drink alcohol. And we don't, I know, I don't want to encourage anybody to take even the tiniest amount of alcohol who doesn't want alcohol in their body for whatever reason. And the last are vinegars. There's only one plant that I'm going to talk about today that I put in vinegar. Vinegars are less stable, um, but they, the acetic acid, which is a small percentage of the vinegar, does extract things and does hold it more stable than, for instance, a tea. Common external preparations uh, include compresses. I'm gonna compare compresses and poultices. Uh, I think often they get uh, miscategorized. Uh, so a compress is when you make a tea and you put a cloth in the tea and then you put that cloth on your body and that's called a compress. There, I use them a lot for infections. So basically make a really strong chaparral tea or Oregon grape root tea or Japanese barberry tea. And then I put a cloth on it and I put that directly on the infection. A poultice uh, is when you put the herb directly on the infection. So for instance, if somebody had inflammation and I soaked a bunch of willow bark and then I put the willow bark directly on, let's say their swollen knee, not an infection, but let's say the swollen knee from a strain, uh, that would be a poultice. I don't use that many poultices and in infections because I don't want foreign material in the wound if they're external because you don't get poultices internally. So I often, um, I don't use poultices that often just because they're just harder to use. It's just easier to make a compress, make really strong tea and put the cloth on. Uh, there are times, you know, like I use poultices, the most common is a spit poultice for a bee sting where you chew something up like tobacco and put that on the bee sting. Um, but I, I use less poultices. Uh, I use a lot of liniments. So a liniment is a plant in isopropyl alcohol, uh, Rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol in water and rubbing alcohol works great for these to make medicines from. So a liniment is basically like a tincture except it's externally used. So you make a liniment by putting a plant in isopropyl alcohol and then applying that topically. Uh, for a while it was not because people were making their own hand sanitation products. Basically for a while, all the isopropyl alcohol was sold out. I haven't looked, but I'm assuming it's back in market. Um, but the beauty of liniments is in a wound, you can put like a, it's less expensive. So let me, let me clear this up. So tinctures and liniments are plants based in alcohol. Tinctures are based in ethanol, which is way more expensive because of the tax placed on ethanol, which is drinking alcohol. Liniments are based in isopropyl alcohol, which is 
less expensive, but it's the same price to make, but it doesn't have that tax that ethanol does. And so as somebody who does a lot of free healthcare and in first aid, it's always free and I'm applying a lot of medicines externally, I use liniments. So liniments are approximately, so isopropyl alcohol is approximately three times more poisonous than ethanol. So you wanna be cautious with it, but putting on external, unless they have a lot of open space and you're constantly applying it is reasonably safe. So you can look at this up more, but I use liniments on small cuts and infections very regularly, but you could use a tincture, it's just more expensive. The beauty of having a tincture though, is you can give it internally and externally. The liniment could only be used externally. A liniment, a plant-based and isopropyl alcohol. I do use some essential oils topically. Um, let's see, and then sometimes I use infused oils, not so much on infections. In fact, I usually avoid infused oils and infections. And infused oils, when you take an, a plant and you soak it in oil like calendula or chaparral or you can grapefruit and you soak it in like extra virgin olive oil. But I mostly I avoid oils in infections because many bacteria are slightly anaerobic, like staph bacteria likes an 18% oxygen environment. We breathe in this out here is 21% oxygen. So putting some oil on it, I worry about giving the infectious material exactly what it wants, a slightly oxygen reduced environment to grow. So I don't use oils for infections is really what I'm saying. That's why I use liniments because the alcohol in itself is disinfecting. Um, I, I don't use salves that often. There are some times when I use salves, which is oil and a beeswax preparation. Um, but I think it, it won't be covered too much in this class. Um, and so those are some of the external preparations uh, that I use. So compresses, essential oils, liniments, um, poultices, and salves. What I want to do now is talk about some categories of herbs. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to say some categories, why I use those categories, and then a few herbs in each category. You can, expand, you can extend and expand each category categorically, um, but I'm just going to name a few that I use regularly uh, for internal and external infections. So I'm about to go into herbs, I'm about to go um, discuss the therapeutic categories uh, that I think about when I see an infection and what categories I want to use to help uh, help the person. So first we have adsorbents. So that's A-D, not A-B. So this is something you can look up. So an absorbent is very different, well, chemically or how it works than an absorbent. So I use adsorbents, A-D, adsorbents, uh, a lot, especially for uh, external problems like staph infections. So I use activated charcoal, which is an adsorbent externally for things like staph infections. When I get to staph, I'm gonna cover this in more detail. I also use adsorbents and by adsorbents, I really just mean activated charcoal. You can look up activated charcoal. So when you look up information, right? If it, does, if the, if it says it does everything, that's malarkey. If it says it doesn't do anything, that's malarkey. Try to find that middle ground uh, good luck finding the middle ground online. Um, but activated charcoal is really useful, but there are many, many things that I see attributed to it that are, is, are incorrect. And so I would suggest looking that up yourself. And so, but the adsorbents are really helpful. So externally on, so most infections you see on the skin are staph infections. And so I'll sometimes use it with other herbs, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, and also I give them, if somebody has uh, food poisoning, and it hasn't been too long since they've gotten the food poisoning. So by food poisoning, it might be salmonella, it could be E. coli, uh, it could be shigella, it could be any of these food or water poisoning. Uh, almost all of these, or all of those are bacteria. And so what you can do uh, is take activated charcoal internally to try to adsorb the bacteria. So activated charcoal is very helpful by clinging onto pathogens or their toxic waste products or byproducts like endotoxins and exotoxins. So bacteria make products uh, that sometimes are worse than the bacteria, often are worse than the bacteria themselves. So without going into detail about those toxins, I will say that activated charcoal, the adsorbent with a D, um, 
used externally could help adsorb, for instance, staph infections, and internally, some of the bacteria, if they're still in your lumen, meaning your stomach or your intestine. So very helpful. There's lots of information. I'm sure I have five videos somewhere online, not all free, of course, um, and other people as well, uh, to learn more about activated charcoal. Very useful uh, herb for infections. What I want to cover now are antibacterials. And I want to say, so most of the times, the mechanism for these is not well understood. So there are not that many herbs that have been really well described in clinical double blind placebo controlled studies with all eyes on deck with, you know, peer review papers. These things can be important um, on it. And so the reason I'm really bringing it up now is because I'm gonna say that some of these herbs are antibacterial and will be antiviral when I get to that section. And so the importance is those are two different things. Bacteria are free living organisms that grow outside of your cells and get nutrition from your cells and tissues. Viruses, as like the COVID-19, move into your cell, replicate themselves there, explode outward and create many more copies. It is harder to kill viruses because they're not in between cells, they're often in cells replicating themselves. So the, I would say that most antibacterial herbs are gonna be more specific in either inhibiting or killing the bacteria, like creating a, a hostile environment for the bacteria in your body. For the viruses, <clears throat> maybe some of the herbs, <clears throat> excuse me, directly kill the organism Uh, but probably uh, many of the herbs probably stimulate uh, innate and adaptive immunity in order to kill the organism. So I'll say that again. So many of the antibacterials might stimulate immunity to kill the bacteria, but from some studies, some of the, the constituents from those plants get in your bloodstream and directly can kill or inhibit bacteria. The antivirals may directly inhibit or kill back uh, viruses, excuse me, we're talking about viruses, but probably a bunch of them just, you know, are just like so far into the body, the immune system gets all whacked and high strung and it just starts killing the viruses as well. So basically you're flooding your body with white blood cells. This may be true. I mean, the, the white blood cells have to be specific for the virus in order for it to be functional. Um, but this is why there are many antibacterial and antiviral herbs uh, that many herbs do both. But why and how is less well known, very well unknown very unknown well. So I'm gonna name some of my favorite uh, antibacterial uh, herbs. If I ever had a singing voice, I would totally do a Julie Andrews whenever I say my favorite whatever herbs. So fortunately I don't. So again, these are in alphabetical order by the genus and species of the plant. Um, so I'm gonna tell you the common name, then the genus and the species and uh, the plant. So these herbs kill or inhibit bacteria. These are the ones that I use the most uh, for infections externally and internally for bacterial infection. So you might have staph, strep, shigella, E. coli, salmonella. Um, so some of those, and then there of course are many others. So first is yarrow, which is Achillea millifolium. Um, so yarrow has antibacterial and antiviral properties. So I also use it for respiratory viruses, which are a virus, not a bacteria. Um, the one thing I want to say about yarrow is avoided in pregnancy. Um, the midwife and birth assistants that I work with avoided in pregnancy, and they're way smarter than I am about this. And so I, don't, I avoid it in pregnancy. Uh, the next herb, I'm not going to go into a big description about each herb. That would be a very long class. Um, the next herb are things in the genus Berberus. These are probably the ones I use the most. So the genus Berberus, so plants that used to be in the genus Mahonia are now in the genus Berberus. So what I mean is Oregon grape root and Japanese barberry, not Japanese knotweed, Japanese barberry, which is extremely weedy uh, just south of here in the Catskills, a couple hundred miles. So I use a lot of Japanese barberry and Oregon grape root. Both of these plants are currently in the genus Berberus. Um, there are other plants in the genus Berberus like yellow root in the Southeast, uh, Xanthorhiza. Um, 
But these are probably my go-to antibacterial and antiviral herbs more than anything else. And the reason for it is just lots of studies on berberine, which is one of the constituents in the genus Berberus. It's the bright yellow alkaloid that you see when you cut these plants. Also, it's fairly extractable in a number of menstruum. And more than almost anything else, Japanese barberry, which is Berberus lumbergii, is really weedy in the Catskills. Again, like 200 miles south here, 150 miles south. And so it's, you can get lots of it. It's not like taking Oregon grapefruit, which is a native plant, which you wanna be much more careful about gathering. Uh, the Japanese barberry is just all over and people are, I'm going down there this weekend to visit a friend next weekend. And I'll probably try to extract some. People love it when you take it out because it just like inhabits their whole yard and it's thorny and prickly, but extremely medicinal and useful as an antibacterial and antiviral externally. So for things like staph infections and internally, um, for things like the bacteria that I mentioned. Uh, next uh, is myrrh. So I use myrrh also mostly as an antibacterial, both externally and internally. Uh, there's a number of things, you know, so Camifera is the genus of myrrh. And there's a number of things like this Camifera molmol and Camiferous mokul. And, I, you know, so some of them are considered like the classic myrrh and some are not. So mostly I use Camifera mol, mol, M-O-L, M-O-L, when I get a chance. Uh, but I'll use some of those other things that are closely related uh, to myrrh. But I like to use these things externally on infections because they stick. So because it's a resin, it'll stick, which is really great. So you just get more adhesive time against the staph infection, let's say, or even if you're gargling with the birth strep infection. And also, though, just taking it internally uh, as an antibacterial. There's lots of good studies um, on uh, myrrh. So as an antibacterial. Uh, next is echinacea. Echinacea is going to show up a lot here. So the reason that I use a lot of echinacea is that it stimulates both innate and adaptive immunity. So echinacea gets your immune system more active. So you want to be careful with echinacea if you have an autoimmune condition. So it's not common, but it happens. So there's many autoimmune conditions, anything from Sjogren's syndrome to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, to multiple sclerosis, um, to lupus. So if you have an autoimmune condition, and again, there are many I didn't mention, uh, you might wanna use it a little bit cautiously, especially if you're taking it for a long period of time. Uh, my experience in the clinic is it doesn't usually affect people's autoimmune condition, but occasionally it does, and you might be that person that it does. Uh, but again, I use echinacea as an antibacterial to get your own immune system wired up and ready to kill stuff. You get those white blood cells active, both in the adaptive immune system, that's your T and B cells, and your innate immune system, uh, that's your initial reaction to the infection. So I use lots and lots of echinacea. I pretty much just use purpurea uh, because it's the one that's most widely grown. Nobody's gathering. It was pretty much during the echinacea wild crafting season, it was just like ex almost extirpated, take it out of the wild environment. So I suggest never gathering wild echinaceas. And purpurea is pretty easy to grow and fairly inexpensive to purchase. Uh, I like to make fresh tincture with it. I get the roots and I put them in a blender with alcohol and I tincture it up. Uh, another antibacterial, and this plant's gonna come up a bunch and that's gonna be chaparral. Chaparral is Larea tridentata. And chaparral is just really strong. It's really hard to get anybody to drink it. It is bitter plus nasty. So it's nasty. And, um, but it's really great at killing it. Chaparral probably kills more organisms on us, including things like fungi, which we'll talk about a little bit, and uh, bacteria and protozoa more than almost any other herb but it's strong and I limit it to usually two weeks uh, at the most taking it. Anything that kills that many things, that many organisms, I worry about putting it in our body on a regular basis. I've never seen any proof that it uh, disrupts our, butt, our gut flora, um, but I, it's just a feeling. Also, it's just so people won't take it for more than a certain amount of time internally anyway. It's just very strong tasting. Uh, I'm not gonna actually cover funguses, so I just wanna say that my favorite foot soak for toenail funguses, which are really hard to get rid of for a bunch of reasons. But I think the herb I've seen the most, it doesn't always work, of course, 
but the herb I've seen that being the most successful for toenail fungus has been really strong chaparral teas that are warm that the person soaks their foot in. So for toenail fungus, because I'm not going to be covering funguses later, really strong chaparral. So, you know, and it's really plentiful where it grows, right? I mean, it's like the whole eco zone is called, well, actually the area called chaparral in Southern California, it doesn't have chaparral plants. Uh, so by chaparral, I mean Larea tridentata, which grows more in two or three of the different uh, Southwestern deserts. Uh, but I just gather lots of it because I live nowhere near there. And then I have it uh, for years at a time. Very, very stable herb, hardly ever goes bad or the aromatics stay there, the compounds are strong. So I really like chaparral for that. Uh, the next one I'm just using more and more, I'm gonna reverse the order so it'll make more sense. First, so I use propolis tincture. Uh, propolis has excellent antibacterial action. It might have some antiviral action, but clearly antibacterial. So often I use it topically, like what I talked about with myrrh on staph infections, because it sticks. It's a resin, so you need alcohol to pull it out, and it'll just stick onto there. So propolis is a plant-derived product. Bees gather the resin from trees and bring it to their hives, and that's what propolis is. So a propolis is great also for strep throats or uh, throat infections, mostly their strep, uh, because if you put it in your medicine and gargle with it, the uh, propolis will stay a little bit longer uh, on the infection, giving you a little more time because it's sticky uh, to kill the strep. Because propolis is expensive, because I don't want to spend the money and maybe, and some people want to avoid bee products, I have been playing with uh, pine resins. So different, I forget what pine I've been using mostly these days, um, but maybe like all, um, uh, balsam poplar. Uh, well, I'm not using balsam poplar. That's wrong. Um, uh, balsam fir, not balsam poplar at all. Balsam fir, uh, collecting the resins from that and from other pine species that make copious amounts of resins. And so I'm using pine resins like I use propolis, but I don't have as much experience yet, but I have been collecting them tincturing them, or sometimes what I do is I'll, if somebody has an infection, you could melt, you know, you could get something like a spoon and use a cloth to hold the spoon so you don't burn your hand and melt the pine resin and get it so it's soft, but not hot. And you can put that on the wound and it sticks really nicely. But you can do that with propolis as well. I just don't carry fresh propolis. So I use pine resin and propolis as antibacterials mostly topically. I have used pine, uh, excuse me, propolis internally uh, as well, especially for throat infections and sometimes for a respiratory infection, uh, but I haven't used pine resins that way yet. Um, so I mentioned already, so my antifungals, uh, chaparral is my favorite. Um, there are two other antifungals that people use. I haven't found as much success with them. One is black walnut, which is juglins species. There's a number of juglins and uh, walnuts, black walnuts, and just walnuts in general. Um, and people often use the outer, and I have used the outer shell. Uh, so the husk of the fruit is the part used, although there are chemicals in the leaves that probably are efficient as antifungals. Another one I haven't used, but I'm interested in trying is neem, which is Azadaraca indica. I don't use it because it doesn't grow here. Um, I used to work, help out, uh, in Nicaragua with Natural Doctors International. I used to go to Nicaragua and where I was in Nicaragua, actually lots of people, neem was growing kind of in the wild, uh, but I had trouble bringing it back. What I'm trying to say is neem looks like it would be a good antifungal and I don't have much experience with it, but hope to someday. Uh, so next is a very important category of herbs for infections and many diseases, and that's anti-inflammatories. So, and most, so <laughs> inflammation is the body's response to multiple pathogenic experiences, to many diseases. When our body gets invaded externally, internally, often inflammation is one course that your body takes to wall things off after bringing in white blood cells. Inflammation is very common part of a disease process. So anti-inflammatories don't kill the disease, but they reduce inflammation, which helps your body potentially recover. So you don't need anti-inflammatories initially, uh, 
So even things like, for instance, if somebody gets food poisoning, they have inflammation of their gut. So initially, I want to kill the infectious agent in their gut, but also I want to give them at one point anti-inflammatories to just reduce the symptom load and reduce the diarrhea because the inflammation is part of that process. So in first aid and just in healthcare in general, uh, anti-inflammatories are very important for symptom reduction, including things like toothaches. They're very helpful because basically we'll get to the toothaches. Getting ahead of myself here. So I'm just gonna read some of the anti-inflammatories I use and say kind of which ones I find a little bit stronger. So yarrow is a mild anti-inflammatory, but its benefits are yarrow achillea millifolium. Yarrow's benefit is that it has antibacterial and antiviral properties um, and anti-inflammatory properties. So while it's not the strongest herb, it grows very commonly in many places um, throughout the Northern hemisphere of the earth. Um, and so it covers many bases, which is just really helpful. Uh, the next uh, is gonna be black birch. So black birch, betula lenta. Um, betula lenta or black birch, so a fairly common tree up where I live in the, in the Northeast, um, has methyl salicylates, which are those wintergreen smells. So it's really nice because it's aromatic. And so those also an anti-inflammatory. So very useful for infections, most infections cause inflammation. A black birch could be used externally. So as a liniment or a compress and internally uh, as a tea, tincture or glyceride. So, and I use the inner bark of black birch which is betula lenta. Um, the next one is echinacea has strong anti-inflammatory actions both externally and internally. And we've talked about echinacea. Uh, so very useful that way. I haven't used it that much externally yet uh, because if I lived around the root and I can make tea with it, I would. Most of the time I have it in liquid preparations, mostly tinctures. Uh, the next one is probably my favorite, I think the strongest internal anti-inflammatory and also for gum infections, for inflammation in the gums, for teeth infections, and that's licorice. So licorice is glyceriza, Glabra, European licorice, or Glyceriza urolensis, Chinese licorice. They should both get quote marks since plants don't actually uh, have nationalities. So the Glyceriza glabra and Glyceriza urolensis are the two, that's mostly when you buy licorice, that's not Twizzlers or some candy licorice um, or pandas. So licorice is really helpful. Avoid it with people with high blood pressure or read much more about how licorice can raise blood pressure. It can raise blood pressure um, about that. Uh, but I find it just one of the best internal anti-inflammatories. One of the problems is many people despise licorice. They, when people despise licorice, they got their hate on. They despise licorice flavor. So then you have to use another herb. Fortunately, we have things like black birch and some other herbs that we can talk about, a yarrow. Um, but mostly I use uh, licorice as an internal anti-inflammatory. In other words, I don't make poultices or compresses with it. That might be helpful. Another useful anti-inflammatory, mostly for gut inflammation, but also externally and internally is chamomile. So matricaria, chamomila, the name changes pretty regularly. Uh, so chamomile uh, is useful externally as a compress. Mostly I use it frankly for sprains and strains, not so much for infections, but internally, as an anti-inflammatory, especially after you've had a gut infection. So again, like salmonella or E. coli, and it's not, it doesn't kill anything, but you have a lot of diarrhea because you have inflammation of your GI tract. Um, two more is willow. Uh, so willow is one of the ones I use the most because it's so common. So whenever I set up a first aid area, I go out and scout the area and see, are, do we have any willow trees? You can also use poplar, but I don't have much experience, so I'm gonna talk about willow. Many willow, probably all willow species have salicylates. Salicylates are the anti-inflammatory compound that is found in willow. Salicylates as an acetyl salicylic acid, as an aspirin, though different, uh, because willow doesn't have that chemical, that cold chemical structure, it has the salicylates in it. So uh, willow can be used externally as poultices, mashing the plant up and applying it onto a wound or a swollen area, uh, and internally as anti-inflammatories. So really a little bit of these anti-inflammatory moves more into sprains and strains. 
Uh, but when you have a disease process, also you might have inflammation. And so mostly I'm really talking about internal use of willow uh, at most of these herbs for infectious disease, uh, like bacterial infections and viral infections where you have inflammation internally. Uh, and the last one that I use a lot of, uh, mostly for Lyme disease, which has a lot of uh, inflammation internally and a lot of joint pain uh, from the cause from the Borrelia bacteria, and that's feverfew, which is Tanacetum parthenium. So feverfew as another anti-inflammatory. Uh, and I use that one, I just use internally, but it's really strong. It's really helpful. Occasionally people react to it. There's some studies, I haven't seen it. Uh, but you can read about it. But I, I feel like feverfew can be specific for certain kinds of internal inflammation um, as, as well as some other inflammatory processes. Uh, but I give it the most uh, when I see a lot of inflammation due to uh, Lyme disease, the Borrelia uh, burgdorferi bacteria. So let me go over those again. We have yarrow, Achillea millifolium. These are anti-inflammatories. We have black birch, Betula lenta, Echinacea, Echinacea species, licorice, Glyceriza urolensis, the Glyceriza um, glabra, uh, chamomile, Matricaria chamomila, willow, Salex species, um, and wild, excuse me, feverfew, not wild anything. Uh, feverfew, Tanacetum parthenium, anti inflammatories. Uh, next category are anti protozoals. Um, so antiprotozoals are plants that kill protozoa and protozoa again are things like the malaria. I've never tried, I, I don't have much experience with malaria. So I'm going to move out of that. That's the plasmodium a genus, a couple of things in there. Uh, but I do have experience with giardia and amoebic dysentery. So giardia is caused by giardia. It's called giardiasis, the disease and amoebic dysentery is caused by entamoeba histolytica, uh, which is the amoeba that causes amoebic dysentery. Very common worldwide. Both of these are common worldwide. Um, and they cause, especially the amoebic dysentery causes really terrible diarrhea. So these are protozoas. I'm gonna enter a new plant here um, that I'm not gonna talk about much more, but my, anti, my favorite anti-protozoal plant uh, is Chaparro, Chaparro amargosa. The genus is Castella and the species is a Moriae. Don't, don't gather this plant, find it from people who maybe who've ethically, it's just, all right, the problem is it's not that common in the United States. I hear it's more common in, in parts of Mexico and sold sometimes at herb vendors on the street. This is where I would look for Chaparro amargosa. Um, but I have gathered it and have used it uh, when it was possible to do that. And the plant is some of the, has strong anti-protozoal properties. So I use it for amoebic dysentery and giardia. Uh, Chaparro, not chaparral, Chaparro amargosa, Castella amorii. There's one or two other species that, there's one other species that's used similarly. Um, but again, please be cautious if you get it, where you're getting it from. Uh, I don't know anybody who cultivates it. So hopefully you're getting from a place where it's abundant. Uh, the next group of plants, I keep trying to change the wrong screen. Uh, the next group of plants are uh, antivirals. And uh, so antivirals are plants that help kill viruses. And there's a number of antivirals. Um, and again, the mechanism is not clear whether they kill the virus or whether they increase T and B cells in the body to kill a virus or get lymph nodes more active somehow. Uh, but uh, there are some really useful antivirals. They include garlic, which is a fairly weak antiviral, but still there. And of course, the beauty of garlic is that it tastes delicious. Um, and it, you can put it in food. And so you're getting it there. If you cook it too much, it probably loses its antiviral properties. Uh, but you can do it like making you know, garlic honey or something like that, or garlic tea. Garlic tea really gives people dragon breath though. Um, but garlic has some uh, mild antiviral properties, but it's easy to get into people's bodies. Uh, one of the strongest antivirals that I use regularly is wild indigo, which is Baptisia tinctoria. Baptisia tinctoria, wild indigo. 
uh, as an antiviral. Um, it's uh, it's uh, hopefully you get it from people who are growing it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Seems a little negative. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm just worried about people over harvesting plants. Um, so Baptisia tinctoria, some people do grow it and it's just a really useful all around antiviral uh, for various viruses, respiratory viruses, uh, stomach flus, when there are virus like a norovirus, uh, it's helpful there. The Oregon grape roots and the Japanese barberry, things in the genus Berberus are useful antivirals. So these are all things for, everything here is for infections, right? Because this is a class, hopefully that's still about infections. Um, another really useful for respiratory viruses in specific is Boneset. Boneset is Eupatorium perfoliatum, Eupatorium perfoliatum. Unfortunately, uh, it's been seen, it looks like, I mean, it's, it has. So Boneset has what are called pyrolizidine alkaloids. And so there's a number of kinds of pyrolizidine alkaloids and it looks like the pyrolizidine alkaloids, this is the things associated with comfrey and the reduction of its use. Um, that bone set has those as well, many plants do. Um, and so I've reduced my use of bone set. It was really, that was a heartbreaker. I, I just, bone set is like, it grows around here. I use it for respiratory viruses. It seems really efficient. Uh, but at this point, I don't give it to people who have any kind of frank liver damage. Uh, in other words, I know there's something wrong with the liver, whether it's cirrhosis or hepatitis, and just avoid it there. And even if they don't, I stop it after two weeks with everybody. Um, and so I don't know if that's the best recommendation, but that's the recommendation I'm making now. But bone set for as an antiviral uh, for respiratory viruses. Another antiviral. This one also has, um, gets over harvested. So I would say buy it from people who have cultural use of it. Who So in other words, indigenous folks who know the rituals and rites of gathering this plant properly and not over harvesting. And that's gonna be OSHA uh, or bear root, which is Lugusticum porteri. So there are many OSHAs, uh, but the OSHA that I use for medicine is the one that's Lugusticum porteri. And it's also a respiratory antiviral. I worry about it's over harvesting like so many other plants. So if you get it, get it from people who have cultural appropriate uses for it and know how to gather it uh, and or wild crafters that are clearly uh, have ethical wild crafting practices. There are not many people that are growing it. Uh, and so be careful about where you get your OSHA sourced from, uh, but it is a really excellent antiviral uh, herb um, and holds great strength. So, uh, so I'm, I'm a Russian Jew, uh, non-indigenous, well, I guess indigenous to Actually, Jews are pretty much non-indigenous to anywhere since we've been a traveling tribe for so long. Um, but I do, you know, sometimes if I have some, I'll bring it if I'm working with indigenous nations um, as, as because it just holds a lot of profoundness as far as being useful medicinally as well. So uh, the last herb that has some antiviral respiratory properties is propolis. And... Um, I think I've already talked about propolis. Right, sorry, losing myself. So, I, I, so when I talked about OSHA, I, at this point in history, plants are being wildcrafted. Plants are being, I think, sometimes misused, and I think there's also some cultural misappropriation. And this, these are important for me, and so I want to bring them up because I think it's important for everybody. And some plants like OSHA just are, are really important to be very respectful around. Probably all plants to be respectful, and then some plants hold a higher honor amongst groups of people. And I think we should be very respectful of that. Uh, the next two herbs, uh, these are herbs that I just use mostly internally to increase, sometimes externally, to increase the bioavailability of the herb. So if you have an infection, what you wanna do is make sure the herbs that you put in your body or outside your body actually make it into your blood vessels and get distributed or at least into your local tissues where you have the infection. So there are two herbs that I use regularly to increase bioavailability. Uh, they are uh, cayenne pepper. Uh, so be careful using it externally or internally. It can be very hot, but small amounts of cayenne. So if I'm <clears throat> giving some, somebody a long-term respiratory infection or Lyme disease, and you want to make sure you're giving those herbs at echinacea, that Oregon grape root, the myrrh, whatever you're giving them, you want to make sure that it gets to the tissue. 
And so I might add small amounts, like five drops per ounce of tincture uh, to that. Another herb that increases to, to get the herb to the area it's going to. Another herb <clears throat> that's helpful uh, for bioavailability is prickly ash. And so prickly ash is xanthoxylum. And I think the strongest is xanthoxylum claviherculus, although that there are a number of species of xanthoxylum. Um, and so I use prickly ash. Mostly I just use this internally for the same thing, to add it to medicines to increase the bioavailability in the body. Some people, I haven't used much black pepper, um, and that's also used this way. So I'm gonna take a short break and then we'll come back. And so this will probably be a two-part video. And then the next part, I'll talk about some pathologies and ways to treat them.